warning, the game uses optical illusions that can have minor visual effects lasting for months. View the illustration at your own risk. The dev is not liable for any negative or damaging effects that can occur. As a result of this game, we recommend providing this warning for anyone who else who may be viewing. The use of this illusion can be turned off in the settings. I understand the above and wish to continue. Let's go. Establishing connection. Are you able to read this? See. Si. See, si, Poppy. Please respond with no. No. Please respond with yes. No. <laughs> Connection unstable. All right, all right, all right, we'll do what he asks. Establishing connection. C. Please respond with no. No. Please respond with yes. Us. C. C. Please respond with die. No. Okay. Beginning cognitive test. Is curious George's tail shorter than his finger? No. Is a shoe smaller than a house? Of course. Does two plus three equal five? Yeah. Is the Monopoly man's monocle bigger than his hat? I think so. <laughs> This is very curious. It's two plus three equal five. Yes. Is a shoe smaller than a house? Of course. Is curious George's tail shorter than his finger? Yes. Am I able to read this? See, Poppy. Oh, oh see, see, Poppy. See. Please respond with no. Please respond with no. Fuck no. Is the Monopoly man's monocle bigger than his hat? Does two plus three equal five? Is a shoe smaller than a house? Yes. True. Is Curious George's tail longer than his finger? Well, he is a monkey. Yes. What? What? Game. See, like, am I pro am I progressing? And I just don't don't realize that I'm progressing, and it's gonna fuck with me. Or am I just going in the same circle? Okay, let's find out what a dumbass I am. 
Oh, wait, we already did that, what, three times now? He's a Monopoly man's monocle bigger than his head. No. It's Curious George's tail shorter than his finger. No. Does two plus three equal five? It and does. It indeed, indeedly, diggly doodle. It damn sure diggity does. Is this shoe smaller than the house? I'm, no, I'm gonna put my. Hey, honey, go get your house out of the shoes. Hey, honey, go get your shoes out of the house. Shoes out of the house means the shoes go in the house, which means the shoes are smaller. Is the shoe smaller than a house? You're goddamn right it is. Is the ocean red? Huh. I'm not, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. Patient has completed cognitive test. Ing. <laughs> Beginning self identity test. Is your name Thomas Mandela? Uh, it's not. It's not. Are you 13 years old? I'm, thank fucking God I'm not. Were you born in Wyoming? Negative. Is your mother's first name Angela? But see, what if it was? Like... Okay, so it's not AAA and millions of people aren't playing it, but enough people are, But people will play this game. It shows a good community. So what happens if your mother's name was Angela and you were playing the game, you know, straight keel? Would you then say yes and, and like not be able to get through this question? Patient What? Bro. Hello. This is Dr. Jimmy Mass communicating with you from the Torrid County Hospital. If you're reading this right now, don't be alarmed. This may seem absurd to you, but you are currently in a coma. Your brain waves indicate that you're a dumbass and are hallucinating or dreaming. We do not know what you may currently be experiencing but it is very important that you follow my instructions okay all right in order to wake up it's very likely that you have recently experienced a loss of identity to help you regain your identity we will be stimulating your hippocampus where the memories are held to reactivate memories of events leading up to your identity loss. Due to the nature of your specific circumstances, your mind may attempt to alter these memories. Do not let your mind alter these memories. <clears throat> if the memory becomes too unstable, you may be unable to wake up. Is this message understood? Oh, see, Poppy, see. Great. Memory stimulation will begin in three, two, one. Look around the room and pay attention. Objects may change when not visible. Okay, so we got Einstein's head. We got an eraser and a piece of chalk. This is a chair. This is a radio. Okay. So when something... Did you notice the front board has changed? Click to change it back. Do not click objects that are not changed. I want you to take a good look at your surroundings. Pay very close attention to the things around you. Now, close your eyes. 
If you're indoors, do you remember what colour the walls are? Do you remember where the lights are? If something in your surroundings were to change, like the texture of the ceiling or the position of items in front of you, would you notice? We like to believe that our memory and perception form true snapshots of the world around us. But upon closer inspection, we begin to see that they are just fragile fabrications constructed by our brains. On today's episode of the Natural Sciences Podcast, we will explore the nature of our memories, perception and the brain. Memory is something that we rely on each and every day. On a basic level, we use it to help locate our keys and to remember computer passwords. However, on a more fundamental level, memory plays a key role in our personal identity, beliefs and behaviour. Without memory, we wouldn't have any real connection to the things we've accomplished, the events we've experienced or the people we love. 17th century British philosopher John Locke argued that personal identity or the self is founded on memory. That is to say that your memory is what defines you as an individual over time, not your physical body or soul. Nonetheless, even though we trust our memories to form our beliefs and identities, our memories themselves are highly error-prone. To talk about this, we are interviewing Dr. Agatha Cage, a psychologist at the University of Michigan, about the nature of human memory. So what is memory and why is it important? That's a good question. At a basic level, memory is just the way our mind stores and remembers information. However, such a basic definition would understate its importance. We need memories in order to get a basic grasp of the world around us. Memories tell us who we are, the things we've done, and our goals in life. It's difficult to properly convey its meaning to us as human beings, so instead I'll explain it through the story of a man named Scott Bolzan. When Mr. Bolzan was 46 years old, he had accomplished a lot in his life. He attended Northern Illinois University on full athletic scholarship and played football professionally for a few years after graduating, even briefly playing for the New England Patriots. After an injury that ended his football career, he then became an entrepreneur. He owned and operated a financial planning firm and then became a pilot and ran a successful private jet management company. During this time, he also met and married his wife and raised his two children. However, in December of 2010, he had a workplace accident and lost all of his memories leading up to that point. When he had awoken from the hospital, he didn't even recognize his wife of 25 years. In an interview with ABC News, Mr. Bolzan described the experience as just being lost because he lost who he was. Events such as his first date, his first kiss with his wife, his wedding day, the birth of his children, he had absolutely no recollection of and no emotional attachment to. He was unable to remember any of the important people in his life, his parents, wife, kids, friends, and relatives. He lost Whoa! Okay. Do we have to start all over again? I want no, you okay. to take a good look at your surroundings. Yeah. Pay very close attention to the things around you. Now, close your eyes. If you're indoors, do you remember what color the walls are? Do you remember where the lights are? If something in your surroundings were to change, like the texture of the ceiling or the position of items in front of you, would this is cool. you notice? We like to believe that our memory and perception form true snapshots of the world around us. But upon closer inspection, we begin to see that they are just fragile fabrications constructed by our brains. On today's episode of the Natural Sciences Podcast, we will explore the nature of our memories, perception and the brain. So we have to look for a, listen to a podcast while we're looking for changes. Memory is something that we rely on each and every day. On a basic level, we use it to help locate our keys and to remember computer passwords. However, on a more fundamental level, memory plays a key role in our personal identity, beliefs and behaviour. Without memory, we wouldn't have any real connection to the things we've accomplished, the events we've experienced or the people we love. 17th century British philosopher John Locke argued that personal identity or the self is founded on memory. That is to say that your memory is what defines you as an individual over time, not your physical body or soul. 
Nonetheless, even though we trust our memories to form our beliefs and identities, our memories themselves are highly error prone. To talk about this, we are interviewing Dr. Agatha Cage, a psychologist at the University of Michigan, about the nature of human memory. So what is memory and why is it important? That's a good question. At a basic level, memory is just the way the mind stores and remembers information. However, such a basic definition would understate its importance. We need memories in order to get a basic grasp of the world around us. Memories tell us who we are, the things we've done, and our goals in life. It's difficult to properly convey its meaning to us as human beings, so instead I'll explain it through the story of a man named Scott Bolzan. When Mr. Bolzan was 46 years old, he had accomplished a lot in his life. He attended Northern Illinois University on a full athletic scholarship and played football professionally for a few years after graduating, even briefly playing for the New England Patriots. After an injury that ended his football career, he then became an entrepreneur. He owned and operated a financial planning firm and then became a pilot and ran a successful private jet management company. During this time, he also met and married his wife and raised his two children. However, in December of 2010, he had a workplace accident and lost all of his memories leading up to that point. When he had awoken from the hospital, he didn't even recognize his wife of 25 years. In an interview with ABC News, Mr. Bolzan described the experience as just being lost because he lost who he was. Events such as his first date, his first kiss with his wife, his wedding day, the birth of his children, he had absolutely no recollection of and no emotional attachment to. He was unable to remember any of the important people in his life, his parents, wife, kids, friends, and relatives. He lost the know-how and ability to run his company. He's quoted as saying, because I have no concept of who I am as a person, I don't know what my dreams, my aspirations, what my goals were. Imagine this happening to you. If you lost your memories, you would lose everything that makes you, you. The things that you've accomplished, the relationships you've built, the knowledge that you've acquired, and the formative events that shaped who you are. When we think about what it's like to live without our memories, its importance in our lives becomes much more clear. Mr. Bolzan's story is quite compelling. It seems as though memory is incredibly foundational to our own personal identity. Yet we are sometimes told that our memories can't be trusted, that they're unreliable. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yes, Very it's true. more true than most people think. Research has shown us that memories aren't these static snapshots of the world around us. Instead, they're more like malleable stories about the past. I'll go over some well-known research in criminal psychology that demonstrates the fallibility of our memories. The first experiment I'll talk about was conducted by Professor Elizabeth Loftus and some of her colleagues at the University of Washington. The setup was pretty simple. Researchers showed participants a video of a car crash. Participants were then asked one of two questions. The first was along the lines of approximately how fast were the cars going when they hit each other. The second was approximately how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other. Despite the fact that participants saw the exact same video, the participants that were asked the second question claimed that the cars were traveling significantly faster than the participants who were asked the first question. A follow-up study showed that when asked a few weeks later whether there was broken glass at the scene, the participants who were asked the second question were far more likely to say that there was than those who were asked the first question. There was no broken glass in the video. This study shows that memory is highly suggestible. What we think is objective truth about what we have observed is actually what our brains reconstruct and create on the spot. Another series of studies looked at ways to take advantage of errors in this reconstruction of memory, otherwise known as confabulation. For example, these studies investigate memory implantation techniques that make participants believe they experienced events that never took place. In one such study from psychologists at the University of Bedfordshire, researchers were able to plant rich, false memories into 70% of participants. These memories included things like committing a crime or getting attacked by a dog. All of this implies that our memories aren't just fallible, they're exploitable. Our brains are capable of just making up stories about the past and convincing us that they're true. So we've established that memory is fundamental to our experiences and identity. We've also established that memory is highly error prone and flawed. How do we reconcile these two points? How do we know what parts of ourselves are real and what parts aren't? Ultimately, we can't know. 
Our understanding of ourselves and of the world is fundamentally flawed. In criminal psychology, there is a well-known case of a woman we call Jane Doe. Initially, her case was used as well-documented proof of repressed memories. In 1984, when Jane was six years old, she was interviewed about sexual abuse allegedly committed by her mother. The evidence included marks on her hands and feet that resulted from her mother burning them on the stove. Eleven years later, though, it seemed as though she had completely forgotten about the incident. Upon viewing the tapes, she vividly remembered the incidents and believed that her mother had abused her. Most experts to this day don't believe that she was lying. Eight years after that, the report was brought into question. New evidence emerged against Jane Doe's claims. The marks on Jane's hands and feet seemed to actually be the result of a skin infection. Investigators also found two pieces of evidence which called the story into question. The first was a report from a clinical psychologist at the time which suggested that the story was confabulated. The second involved documents from a Child Protective Services investigation in which Jane's mother was not found to have committed any such abuse. Furthermore, they found evidence that Jane's father, who was in a heated custody battle with her mother, was abusive towards her brother. Today, most experts agree that the abuse likely... <laughs> Um, so I don't know how far to keep going, like... Let's go, let's go forward one more time, because I think I have... I think I have a better idea of what's changing. Yeah, let's do that. I want you to take a good look at your surroundings. Pay very close attention to the things around you. Now, close your eyes. If you're indoors, do you remember what color the walls are? Do you remember where the lights are? Mm -hmm. If something in your surroundings were to change, like the texture of the ceiling or the position of items in front of you, would you notice? We like to believe that our memory and perception form true snapshots of the world around us. But upon closer inspection, we begin to see that they are just fragile fabrications constructed by our brains. On today's episode of the I don't know Natural if they're fabrications. Podcast, we will explore the nature of our memories, perception, and the brain. I know it's changing here because I'm hyper aware of it. I know things are going to change. But your mind can only handle so much. You can only remember so many details Memory of a certain... is something that we rely on each and every day. On a basic level, we use it to help locate our keys and to remember computer passwords. However, on a more fundamental level, Memory plays a key role in our personal identity, beliefs, and behavior. Without memory, we wouldn't have any real connection to the things we've accomplished, the events we've experienced, or the people we love. 17th century British philosopher John Locke argued that personal identity, or the self, is founded on memory. That is to say that your memory is what defines you as an individual over time, not your physical body or soul. Nonetheless, even though we trust our memories to form our beliefs and identities, our memories themselves are highly error prone. To talk about this, we are interviewing Dr. Agatha Cage, a psychologist at the University of Michigan, about the nature of human memory. So what is memory and why is it important? That's a good question. At a basic level, memory is just the way our mind stores and remembers information. However, such a basic definition would understate its importance. We need memories in order to get a basic grasp of the world around us. Memories tell us who we are, the things we've done, and our goals in life. It's difficult to properly convey its meaning to us as human beings, so instead I'll explain it through the story of a man named Scott Bolzan. When Mr. Bolzan was 46 years old, he had accomplished a lot in his life. He attended Northern Illinois University on a full athletic scholarship and played football professionally for a few years after graduating, even briefly playing for the New England Patriots. After an injury that ended his football career, he then became an entrepreneur. He owned and operated a financial planning firm and then became a pilot and ran a successful private jet management company. During this time, he also met and married his wife and raised his two children. However, in December of 2010, he had a workplace accident and lost all of his memories leading up to that point. When he had awoken from the hospital, he didn't even recognize his wife of 25 years. In an interview with ABC News, Mr. Bolzan described the experience as just being lost because he lost who he was. 
Events such as his first date, his first kiss with his wife, his wedding day, the birth of his children, he had absolutely no recollection of and no emotional attachment to. He was unable to remember any of the important people in his life, his parents, wife, kids, friends, and relatives. He lost the know-how and ability to run his company. He's quoted as saying, because I have no concept of who I am as a person, I don't know what my dreams, my aspirations, what my goals were. Imagine this happening to you. If you lost your memories, you would lose everything that makes you, you. The things that you've accomplished, the relationships you've built, the knowledge that you've acquired, and the formative events that shaped who you are. When we think about what it's like to live without our memories, its importance in our lives becomes much more clear. Mr. Bolzan's story is quite compelling. It seems as though memory is incredibly foundational to our own personal identity. Yet we are sometimes told that our memories can't be trusted, that they're unreliable. Is that true? Yes, it's more true than most people think. Research has shown us that memories aren't these static snapshots of the world around us. Instead, they're more like malleable stories about the past. I'll go over some well-known research in criminal psychology that demonstrates the fallibility of our memories. The first experiment I'll talk about was conducted by Professor Elizabeth Loftus and some of her colleagues at the University of Washington. The setup was pretty simple. Researchers showed participants a video of a car crash. Participants were then asked one of two questions. The first was along the lines of approximately how fast were the cars going when they hit each other. The second was approximately how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other. Despite the fact that participants saw the exact same video, the participants that were asked the second question claimed that the cars were traveling significantly faster than the participants who were asked the first question. A follow-up study showed that when asked a few weeks later whether there was broken glass at the scene, the participants who were asked the second question were far more likely to say that there was than those who were asked the first question. There was no broken glass in the video. This study shows that memory is highly suggestible. What we think is objective truth about what we have observed is actually what our brains reconstruct and create on the spot. Another series of studies looked at ways to take advantage of errors in this reconstruction of memory, otherwise known as confabulation. For example, these studies investigate memory implantation techniques that make participants believe they experienced events that never took place. In one such study from psychologists at the University of Bedfordshire, researchers were able to plant rich, false memories into 70% of participants. These memories included things like committing a crime or getting attacked by a dog. Mm -hmm. All of this implies that our memories aren't just fallible, they're exploitable. Yes. Our brains are capable of just making up stories about the past and convincing us that they're true. And this is why so you have people in jail that, memory is fundamental that haven't committed crimes that they've been accused of. We've also this is why interrogation is techniques by police are... How do we reconcile oh, shit. these two points? How do we know what parts of ourselves are real and what parts are not. Ultimately, we can't know. Our understanding of ourselves and of the world is fundamentally flawed. In criminal psychology, there is a well-known case of a woman we call Jane Doe. Initially, her case was used as well-documented proof of repressed memories. In 1984, when Jane was six years old, she was interviewed about sexual abuse allegedly committed by her mother. The evidence included marks on her hands and feet that resulted from her mother burning them on the stove. Eleven years later, though, it seemed as though she had completely forgotten about the incident. Upon viewing the tapes, she vividly remembered the incidents and believed that her mother had abused her. Most experts to this day don't believe that she was lying. Eight years after that, the report was brought into question. New evidence emerged against Jane Doe's claims. The marks on Jane's hands and feet seemed to actually be the result of a skin infection. Investigators also found two pieces of evidence which called the story into question. The first was a report from a clinical psychologist at the time which suggested that the story was confabulated. The second involved documents from a Child Protective Services investigation in which Jane's mother was not found to have committed any such abuse. Furthermore, they found evidence that Jane's father, who was in a heated custody battle with her mother, was abusive towards her brother. Today, most experts agree that the abuse likely did not happen and that Jane's false memories came from her father's suggestions when she was young. The consequences of this had huge effects on Jane's life. To this day, she's unsure of what is true and what isn't. If our core memories that shape our identity and relationships with others can just be incorrect, what does this say about us? Could we just be an entirely different person than we believe? Jane Doe is quoted as saying, 
what are we if not our life experiences? If we are to believe that those memories are as fallible as some researchers want us to believe they are, what does that leave us with? What are we doing here? Breaking news coming out of Tarrant County, Wyoming. Police are looking for a missing 12-year-old child named Timothy McCullough, who authorities believe is in danger. He's five feet tall with short brown hair and blue eyes. He was last seen wearing a blue t-shirt and gray shorts. Torrid County police say that he may have been with his estranged father, 37-year-old John McCullough, who has recently escaped from prison. If observed, please call 911. Continue? Yes, uh, perception is really a, a funny thing. I think most people take for granted the idea that what we consciously perceive is actually an accurate snapshot of reality. Most people seem to think that our perception is just a window into the world around us. Hmm. What, what do you mean by that? Is that not true? Well, it's pretty clear to tell that we don't always consciously perceive everything that our brain receives as input, right? If you did, uh, you'd be able to see the blood vessels inside your eyes, and you would always feel your heart beating. But we don't. Our brain selectively attends to certain aspects of our perception. Sure, but it's still a form of reality, perhaps just a snippet of it, right? That doesn't seem to be the case either. I think one of the most clear ways to show that is through illusions. Um, illusions show us how the brain alters our reality. Um, since this is a radio show, I, I, I can't really show any optical illusions to your listeners. Um, instead, I'll be demonstrating an auditory one. I want you to listen to the following clip, and I want you to tell me if you understand any of it. I... I didn't understand a word. It just sounds, it just sounds like static noise to me. <laughs> Here, uh, let me play it again. Yeah, no, sorry, still nothing. Now I'm going to play another clip. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. You understand that one, right? Yeah, it says the juice of lemons makes fine punch. Okay, now I'm going to play back the original clip, and I want you to tell me if you understand what it says now. <laughs> Here, uh, let me play it again. Yeah, it's saying the same thing. Exactly. I played you the same exact clip that you heard the first time. The sensory inputs to your brain were identical. Yet... After hearing the unaltered version of the audio, you could understand the garbage. Uh, this shows us that your brain is actually filling in pieces of your reality. You're not directly experiencing the sensory inputs to your brain. You're experiencing your brain's interpretation of those inputs. In other words, your brain is creating or hallucinating your conscious perception. Um, Moreover, you can't really unhear the words when I play the clip now. You have no control over this hallucination. When you say hallucination, that seems to be more related to psychedelics and drugs like LSD. Clearly, those hallucinations are different from hallucinations you're referring to. Actually, uh, no. LSD is actually pretty different from how it's portrayed in the movies. Um, people who have taken LSD say that it doesn't really give you hallucinations. Instead, it shows that real life is the hallucination. <laughs> Some users say that LSD gives them a better glimpse at true reality than the constrained and filtered reality that our brain constructs. Um, if hallucination is uncontrolled perception, then normal perception is also just a more controlled hallucination. This sounds like hippie science. <laughs> well, uh, what I really mean by hallucination is that our perception is more constructed by our brain than it is a direct product of our senses. All of this research points to the fact that um, we don't live in the world. We live in our heads. 
the world we perceive is constructed by our brain. It's not necessarily representative of what is out there. Um, perhaps I'm not the best at explaining it, uh, so I'll read you a quote from one of my colleagues, Professor Anil Seth from the University of Sussex. He said, we don't just passively receive the world, we actively generate it. The world we experience comes as much, if not more, from the inside out as from the outside in. We are all hallucinating all the time. When we agree on hallucinations, we call that reality. That's a good quote. Maybe we should be interviewing him instead. So our perception of the outside world isn't actually real. We can't fully trust it, as shown by illusions, as Jim has shown. Does that mean everything we perceive could just be sensations that our brain is, is making up? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, perception is really a... a <coughs> I think most people take for granted the idea that what we consciously perceive is actually an accurate snapshot of reality. Most people seem to think that our perception is just a window into the world around us. Hmm. What, what do you mean by that? Is that not true? Well, it's pretty clear to tell that we don't always consciously perceive everything that our brain receives as... Let's info, go! Right? If you did, uh, you'd be able to see the blood vessels inside your eyes, and you would always feel your heart beating. But we don't. Our brain selectively attends to certain aspects of our perception. Sure, but it's mm -hmm. still a form of reality. Perhaps just a snippet of it, right? That doesn't seem to be the case either. I think one of the most clear ways to show that is through illusions. Um, illusions show us how the brain alters our reality. Um, since this is a radio show, I, I, I can't really show any optical illusions to your listeners. Um, instead, I'll be demonstrating an auditory one. I want you to listen to the following clip, and I want you to tell me if you understand any of it. I, I didn't understand a word. It just sounds, it just sounds like static noise. Here. I heard yeah, it that time, it though. The taste of lemons makes great punch. Yeah, no, sorry. Still nothing. Now I'm going to play another clip. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. You understand that one, right? Yeah. Yeah, it says the juice of lemons makes fine punch. Okay, now I'm going to play back the original clip, and I want you to tell me if you understand what it says now. Here, uh, let me play it again. Yeah, it's saying the same thing. Exactly. I played you the same exact clip that you heard the first time. The sensory inputs to your brain were identical. Yet, after hearing the unaltered version of the audio, you could understand the garbled one. Uh, this shows us that your brain is actually filling in pieces of your reality. Mm -hmm. You're not directly experiencing the sensory inputs to your brain. You're experiencing your brain's interpretation of those inputs. Right. In and every words, time you recall a memory... Your brain is creating or hallucinating your conscious perception. Um, moreover, you can't really unhear the words when I play the clip now. You have no control over this hallucination. When you say hallucination, that seems to be more related to psychedelics and drugs like LSD. No. Clearly, those hallucinations are different from hallucinations you're referring to. Actually, uh, no. LSD is actually pretty different from how it's portrayed in the movies. Yeah. Um, people That's... who have taken LSD say that it doesn't really give you hallucinations. No. Instead, it shows that real life is the hallucination. Some users say that LSD gives them a better glimpse at true reality than the constrained and filtered reality that our brain constructs. Well, you um, have to be careful how you put that. If is uncontrolled perception, then normal perception is also just a more controlled hallucination. This sounds like hippie sounds. <laughs> exactly, and that's why you have to be careful uh, really how you put it. What I mean by it. hallucination is that our perception is more constructed by our brain than it is a direct 
product of our senses. All of this research points to the fact that um, we don't live in the world. We live in our heads. The world we perceive is constructed by our brain. It's not necessarily representative of what is out there. Um, perhaps I'm not the best at explaining it, uh, so I'll read you a quote from one of my colleagues, Professor Anil Seth from the University of Sussex. He said, We don't just passively receive the world, we actively generate it. The world we experience comes as much, if not more, from the inside out as from the outside in. We are all hallucinating all the time. When we agree on hallucinations, we call that reality. That's a good quote. Maybe we should be interviewing him instead. So our perception of the outside world isn't actually real. We can't fully trust it, as shown by illusions, as Tim has shown. Does that mean everything we perceive could just be sensations that our brain is, is making up? Yeah, uh, exactly. And, and there's a very clear precedent for that. Dreaming. While in a dream, most of us aren't aware of the fact that we're dreaming. We're perceiving sensations that our brains are just creating on the fly. Uh -huh. And we simply accept that it is reality. <sighs> Fuck. Even if it's completely nonsensical and incoherent. Dreams show us how our brains can fool our conscious minds. But how is that possible? It seems strange to suggest that our brains can render entire scenes in our heads. Ah, that's the thing. It doesn't have to be. Our brains have what's called selective attention. That means we hardly notice things that we're not focusing on. Um, here, here's a simple way to demonstrate this. Close your eyes. Okay. You walked into my office and sat down in that chair uh, just a few minutes ago, correct? Yeah. Okay. So, what color is the chair you're currently sitting in? Um, I think it was black. And uh, is the floor carpeted or hard? Um, I'm pretty sure it was carpeted. Good. Okay. What color is the floor? Okay, so that's as far as I'm going to go with this. Um... Not because it's not a good game. It's actually, I for me, this is an amazing game. I love it. Um, it's very, very informational, very educational. Uh, I love learning about stuff like this. I don't know how long this can go on for, and I, it's not. It's more educational than anything, and I don't think that most of my viewers will get this far. It's a lot. I, to me, see, to me, it's an interesting topic. I find that very interesting. Um, yeah, me yeah, memory is severely flawed. Your memories are severely flawed. The longer you've had a memory, the more wrong it becomes every time you try and remember it. Um, it's extremely interesting to me. Um, I think the game is great. I love the game. Um, but it's a lot of listening. Unless you're into podcasts like that, that, you know, unless you seek out this information and you want to learn about it, I don't think it's really, I guess for me, I loved it. I found the information in included extremely valuable. Um, the memory type gameplay was fun and memory gameplay can be fun, uh, but it only lasts a while. But this game was great. This is called Please Wake Up. This is by a developer named Chris Liu. Uh, thank you for emailing me and letting me know that your game is out there. I, I, I really enjoyed this. Uh, if you want, you can pick it up on Itch.io. It's free download. Um, go get it. I'll leave a link for you in the description. Uh, yeah, g give it a shot. It's If you don't know anything about how memory works and how flawed our memories can be I mean this 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 is a trip into you know false confessions and how you can just beat on somebody with an idea long enough and they'll believe it and and you see this in the world all the time so if we keep saying it if we keep telling you this you will believe it eventually you know it this is how brainwashing works this is exactly how brainwashing works. It's manipulation of memories. It's exploitation of the fact that when you walk into a room and you cast a mental image of that room in your head, your brain ignores the small details. Your brain ignores what color your walls are. 
it, it ignores the texture, it ignores the small things, and it keeps the things that your brain deems important where the exits are, um, you know, where the box of tissues is in the room, um, the locate, the layout of the people, you know, you but you ignore the minuscule things, and and that's how memory manipulation can be and is exploited in modern day. You know, I mean, go look at some confession videos. Memory is, yeah, yeah, it's something. I, I really encourage everybody to go out and read about this. I'll stop running on and on and on about it, but really good game. If you enjoyed it, description. If you enjoyed it, please like the video. Uh, if you like the content, please uh, subscribe. Hit that bell notification or whatever. I upload every day, so, yeah. All right, guys, take it easy. This has been Please Wake Up. Give it a shot. I'll talk to you next time we play some more in your. See you later, guys.